Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Good Friday as we gather together online um, for Good Friday t- 2020. Uh, it's my privilege to bring God's word this morning, and we're going to be continuing in our series, Come Behold Him. In, in actual fact, we've just got this week and Sunday or Friday and Sunday to go as we conclude our series in Luke. So I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 23. Uh, we're going to be looking at verse 26 through to verse 49. Uh, today. So if you can turn there, Luke 23, verse 26 to 49, uh, as you sit at home or wherever you are this morning. I'm reading from the ESV. Verse 26, and as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him saying he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. Coming up and offering him sour wine. And saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the King of the Jews. Verse 39, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Please join me as we pray as God would speak to us from his word. Father, we thank you and we praise you that we can gather together differently but still uh, in reality around your word with each other today this good friday 2020 please uh, speak to us through the words of your servant luke that you have inspired about your son and what took place that day please uh, grip our hearts afresh open our eyes to see jesus more clearly and to love him more dearly as a response and we ask this in his name amen Well, as we get further along in this time of global pandemic, one of the things that's happening is this. World leaders, politicians and others are looking for answers. How did this start? Where did it start? What was the source of it? 
How long did people know before disclosing it? What was the role of the World Health Organization? Was there a cover-up? Who's responsible? And so on, and so on, and so on. And it seems that it's fairly clear that getting honest answers to these questions and others is not proving easy. You see, many who have the answer to those questions come from what we call shame and honour cultures, which means they will often do whatever it takes to save face, to avoid a scandal. They'll do whatever it takes to maintain honour and to avoid any form of shame, even at the cost of the truth and even at the cost of human life. Many who are in positions of political and national power around the globe actually function like that. Now today, on Good Friday, I want us to contrast this with Jesus Christ. We're thinking today about his crucifixion. We're thinking about how he was treated shamefully, how he was despised and rejected by men. And what I want us to see today is this, that, he, that though he was publicly, historically and cosmically shamed, he did that willingly to reveal the truth, not to cover it up, and to save our lives in his great love. Two things from our passage today that I want us to see this Good Friday as we gather online together this morning. Firstly, the scandal of Good Friday. The scandal of Good Friday. You see, the reality is this. Good Friday is totally scandalous on a level that will never ever be overtaken what happened on that day 2000 plus years ago is the greatest scandal of all time and it's not the crucifixion itself that is so scandalous as horrendous as that was perhaps the worst form of capital punishment that human beings have ever come up with crucifixion was common so it's not so much the type of death that makes this event such a scandal what is it then well it's actually who they are crucifying that sets it apart it is who they are crucifying that makes it so shocking so scandalous uh, if you've been journeying, journeying with us through Luke's gospel, or if you've read any of the gospels for that matter, and if you haven't, let me encourage you to do so this Easter, to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. If you do, you will see that Jesus Christ is presented to us as God with us. God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Luke, we've seen this again and again and again. We've seen that he is the Lord who his predecessor, John the Baptist, prepares the way for. We've seen that he commands creation and it obeys him. We've seen that he gives sight to the blind. He cleanses the leprous. He causes the lame to walk and the deaf to hear. We've seen that he raises the dead and brings the good news of God's eternal kingdom. We've seen that he speaks the very words of God. We've seen that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, that he's the glorious one who is transformed before his disciples in all his splendor and glory. We've seen that he's the one to which all the scriptures, the law and the prophets have pointed. We've seen that he forgives sins and not only forgives sins, but transforms the hearts of sinners. And now what do we see here on this first Good Friday? We see him being led away after being, tre after being treated with utter contempt by others. We see him weak 
from being beaten and battered as Simon of Cyrene carries his cross, most likely the, the actual cross bar on his shoulders behind Jesus. We see a large crowd as Simon of Cyrene carries this cross. A great multitude are mourning and lamenting for him. Such is the scene they are confronted with. In verse 32 and verse 33, we see he is crucified as a common criminal. Verse 32 says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. God the Son, God with us, the one who came to seek and save the lost, crucified as a common criminal. In verse 34 to 39, the scandal continues to play out. It just keeps going layer by layer. Verse 34, we read this. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. He's most likely at this point naked or very near naked and publicly lit up and shamed as he is crucified. In doing so, he's fulfilling Old Testament scriptures at the very same time. Here, he's quoting Psalm 22, 16 to 28, which says this, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Here he is, naked and ashamed. He's mocked. Firstly, he's mocked by the Jews as the Christ. Notice what they say to him. They mock him and they say he saved others. Let him save himself if, if he is the Christ. The Son of God. This, this goes to his identity. They scoff at him and they deride him as the chosen one of God. Secondly, he's mocked by the soldiers, isn't he? As a king, they say, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. This goes to his power and his might. They say, if you're a powerful king, well, save yourselves. He's laughed at by them as weak and pathetic and then he's scorned he's railed at verse 39 tells us by one of the criminals someone as we read who's worthy of death who's under just condemnation for his deeds he rails at jesus the son of god he attacks him or better the word really here is that he blasphemes him god the son God with us, the second member of the Trinity. Friends, this is the scandal of Good Friday. That this should happen to him. That he should be treated this way by those he has made. By those whose very breath has been given to them by him. This is scandalous, right? Don't you think? I mean, what is going on here? Why is this happening to Jesus? What on earth could have meant that this was necessary to be part of God's plan? It's the scandal of Good Friday. Now, I don't have much medical knowledge, but one of the things I am aware of is that sometimes something that can happen to human beings is they can end up in a state of shock. Maybe some of you have been uh, in a state of shock. We say things like maybe after someone's had a really bad accident, maybe broken a bone or something, they're in shock. He's in shock or she's in shock. And it's kind of an uh, emotional response to what's happened uh, that our body goes into. 
I don't, you can you can look it up later if you want to know more details about it. You know, it's kind of the kind, the kind of thing that happens maybe if you broke an ankle and you know you see a bone protruding out of your leg as you look down, and then suddenly you go kind of numb and uh, you know faint and so on. You go into shock. I want to suggest to you that what we see here on Good Friday is worthy of such a response. Not just the physical realities of what's happening here to Jesus, but the shocking reality of who it is that's being nailed to the tree that day. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should all go into a state of shock on Good Friday. But I am saying this, and I think God's word is clear. We should, we should never gloss over this. We should never treat this lightly. Surely this must affect us. Surely this must shake us up a bit. That Jesus, God with us, God the Son, would be treated like this. Especially when we actually know that it was for us. When we know that it was our sin that meant it was necessary in God's plan. We sing a song uh, quite regularly and it has these words in it. And maybe you'll know them, maybe you don't. Uh, they, it goes like this. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. This is the scandal of Good Friday. Secondly, though, what we also see is the beauty of Good Friday. The beauty of Good Friday. We see it at a number of points in this part of God's word. Firstly, we see it in verse 34 as Jesus says these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We see it in his cry, don't we, to the Father for forgiveness to blind, for blind sinners just like us. Here they are, they're driving the nails into his hand. They're lifting him up on the cross. God with us, God the Son. And what do we hear from his lips? We hear amazing, breathtaking, gracious words. Three words. Three life-changing words. Three words that have impacted people across the centuries. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. This is the beauty of Good Friday. This is the beauty of Good Friday. Again, we see it in verses 35 to 37 as he's mocked and ridiculed and scorned. We see the beauty of Good Friday in that he endures the scorn. He endures the mocking. He endures the blasphemy. He, in that he does not save himself, though he could. John's Gospel tells us that he could summon 12,000 powerful angelic beings at any moment. But he doesn't, does he? He doesn't save himself, does he? Why? Because he is sovereignly suffering in our place to save us, to save you and me. He is suffering to save others. This is the beauty of Good Friday. We see it also in verse 44 and following in the creation and in the curtain. Have a look there in verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Friends, notice that such is the nature of of what is taking place at this point, it actually affects the creation itself. From the middle of the day to the middle of the afternoon, from 12 midday to 3 p.m., we read the light of the sun failed. The light of the sun failed. Friends, notice the, the creation is telling us something here. But what? How can we know what it's trying to tell us? What does that, this phenomena mean 
why, what might interpret it for us? Well, have a look again at verse 44. Darkness comes over the whole land until the ninth hour. Verse 45, while the sunlight, sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Friends, I want to suggest to you that the curtain of the temple interprets the phenomena of creation. The curtain being torn from top to bottom tells us a bunch of things, but for now let's just focus on two. It tells us firstly that the Holy of Holies, that which represents the very presence of God, a place where sinners could never be, is now wide open for some reason. Which means it also tells us that sin has been comprehensively dealt with and paid for. That's what the phenomena is about. That's what was affecting the creation itself. When Jesus, the creator, was showing for all to see in heaven and on earth, that he is also Jesus, the redeemer. Which, secondly, also shows us just how serious our rebellion and our sin is. If when Jesus deals with it, the creation itself in one sense goes into shock. The sun's light failed. Is your sin serious? Is my sin serious? Is our rebellion serious? You bet it is. You bet it is. Early on in our passage today, the women are weeping for Jesus. And he turns to them and says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Why does he say that? Well, he knows that there is going to be a degree of judgment that comes across, comes upon Jerusalem for rejecting their Messiah. It happened in AD 70. And he's saying, don't weep for what I'm going through. That event is going to be frightening. People will want death just to escape it. And that is a small picture of what the great day of judgment will be like when God comes to judge the world in righteousness through Jesus, the man he has appointed. And so here he is on the cross, suffering sovereignly to save us. Here he is on the cross, wanting to say to you and me, turn to me and let me save you from that great day of judgment. It shows us that Jesus' willingness to save, his desire to save, his, his desire to come and his willingness to come and bear the punishment of our sin in his own body on the tree so that the temple curtain would be torn and so that now we can come near to and have re right relationship like never before with the God who himself is holy through the one who has done this for us. This, friends, is the beauty of Good Friday. Now, there are lots of words I'm sure you're aware that, strictly speaking, shouldn't go together. Now, often when we put them together, we call them oxymorons. And we still use them, actually, to great effect. They actually work. Here are a few examples that we might use that, strictly speaking, it shouldn't go together. So, for example, something like this. Deafening silence. Deafening silence. Or a fine mess. Or original copies. Or seriously funny. And on and on it goes. You can come up with your own list, I'm sure. But I want this Good Friday to add one to your vocabulary. I want to add one to your vocabulary. Words that strictly shouldn't go together. And I want you to add this one to your vocabulary, not just as a word you say, but something you think about and ponder and meditate on. When you think of Jesus 
this Easter. Let me encourage you to adopt this one from our passage today. It's these two ideas together. Scandalous beauty. Scandalous beauty. Not sure where else they could be used. Haven't thought about that too much. Maybe there's somewhere. But it certainly fits the breathtaking grace of God in Jesus on the cross towards us. Scandalous beauty. Now let me ask you, as we've thought about the scandal of Good Friday and the beauty of Good Friday, the scandalous beauty of the grace and mercy and love of God in Jesus, how will you respond to him this Good Friday, this Easter? Not just this Easter, but next week and the week after and the week after that. We've got an example of two different responses even in this passage, haven't we, this morning? In these two criminals. Two criminals respond to Jesus who is crucified right in the middle of both of them. I want to encourage you to embrace something about one of them. Two things he does. I want to encourage you to do what one of them does and that is acknowledge you are a sinner worthy of just judgment. He said, we indeed are here condemned justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. He acknowledged that he was a sinner worthy of just judgment. That's the first thing he does. That's the first response he has to the crucified Jesus. The second response he has is this. He looks to Jesus in repentance and faith as his only saviour and lord as his only hope and i want to encourage you to do the same look to jesus in repentance and faith as your only saviour and lord you see what he says he says jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom he didn't do anything he couldn't do anything he was nailed to a cross also there was nothing he could do to make himself acceptable to god other than ask jesus to show him mercy and grace having acknowledged that he is a sinner. And Jesus does. Jesus says to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Friends, can I say from wherever, wherever you are watching online today, God bless you this Good Friday. May the scandalous beauty of Jesus' death for you flood your hearts this Easter. Also, uh, don't forget on Sunday, we'll also have another online gathering ready for you as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, as we come and we gather and, and, and just with joy, affirm in our own hearts and minds that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Have a great Good Friday and we'll see you on Sunday. God bless.